Lord, good evening, everyone. And uh, it's uh, my great uh, pleasure indeed to introduce Ben Amparper's new book. Bernard, as many of you know, is the Isolder and Seville Salzbacher Professor of Law and Political Science, or, and uh, most recently, the Executive Director of the newly founded Eric Holder Initiative for Civil and Political Rights at Columbia University. He is also the founding director of the Columbia Center for Contemporary Critical Thought, which uh, many of us have attended many sessions of. It's a remarkable, remarkable institution that has brought together many distinct lines of conversation and that has assembled a remarkable collection of people throughout uh, New York City and uh, beyond. Uh, Bernard has uh, authored uh, several books. His scholarship is at the intersection of social and political theory, the sociology of punishment, and in particular penal law and procedure. And I cannot but uh, help mention this. Many of you will have been reading about the remarkable work that he has done in recent uh, Years, in fact, it's a work that goes back to 30 years of defending a prisoner on death uh, row. And he has just returned from uh, Alabama after several grueling, uh, grueling weeks. So thank you on behalf of this republic, which is teetering on failure, for at least upholding <laughs> the Constitution, for trying to somehow defend the Eighth Amendment against cruel and unjust, unjust punishment. Bernard's previous uh, book, uh, prior to this one, was uh, Exposed Desire and Disobedience in the Digital Age, which was uh, very widely reviewed, and there are many continuities, I think, between the themes of that book and this uh, current one. I should also just mention um, uh, at the end that Bernard is the, uh, one of the uh, editors of uh, Foucault's uh, uh, Collège de France uh, lectures. He has uh, edited the new Peliad edition of uh, Surveille et Punir, and he's also director de recherche at the Code des Institutes in uh, Paris. Uh, we often don't know how he does all these things. We wonder how many hours a night uh, he sleeps. Some of us, his good friends and colleagues, speculate. <laughs> now, commenting on uh, Bernard's book is uh, uh, Ude Meta, who is Distinguished Professor of Political Science at the CUNY uh, Graduate uh, Center. And uh, Professor Meta has taught at several universities, including Princeton, Cornell, MIT, and also Amherst College before he joined CUNY Center. He is the author of The Anxiety of Freedom, Imagination, and Individuality uh, in the Political Thought of John Locke, and most recently, the very well-known book, Liberalism and Empire. Uh, in general, his work is at the intersection of post-colonial and liberal theory, and he's currently working on a forthcoming book entitled A Different Vision, Gandhi's Critique of Political Rationality. I believe a couple of weeks ago, Bernard disclosed in a session of the CCCP that he was, what was the relationship between you two when you were both Sheldon Wallen students at Princeton? Which okay. seems to be part of the context behind this book as well. Right. But I didn't quite remember. Yeah, yeah, no, Uday was uh, Sheldon Wallen's graduate student. And I was, um, I was Sheldon Mullen's undergraduate student. I was writing my thesis with, my undergraduate thesis with Sheldon. And, and, I, and that's where we met back at Princeton many, okay. many years ago. And I actually sat in on the Boudet's dissertation class. Great. Right. <laughs> and I think that it's, uh, it's clear uh, the, the Wollum uh, accent and influence on both of your, both of your works. Now, uh, the book has just appeared. And I haven't read it all, who they has, but I uh, just uh, am going to read two paragraphs from the introduction uh, to the book to give you a flavor, and then I turn it over uh, to Ude and Bernard. Uh, the book begins as follows. 
On December 9, 2014, California Senator Diane Feinstein made public a 547-page report by the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence documenting the widespread use of torture by the United States after 9-1-1. The Senate report revealed far more intensive applications of torture than had previously been known. One prisoner was waterboarded at least 183 times. At one point, within less than 24 hours, he was subjected to more than 65 applications of water during four waterboarding sessions, um, etc. Uh, Bernard continues. He says, and at the same time as the release of the Senate torture report, the drone strike in the Shabwa province in Yemen with which we are not at war, and that actually killed 13 innocent civilians and bystanders, that the drone strike in the Shabwa province, the reauthorization of NSA's domestic surveillance, and the NYPD's targeting of American Muslims, <coughs> a second wave of protests against police shootings erupted in Ferguson, Missouri the site of the fatal police shooting of 18-year-old Michael Brown on August 9, 2014. So these events taking place within a very short period of time around the release of the Diane Feinstein torture report. The renewed protests were fueled in part by the decision of the grand jury in Staten Island, New York, to refuse to indict NYPD officer Daniel Pantaleo in the checking the choking death of Eric Garner. It was during those many waves of protests in Ferguson and elsewhere around the country that we witnessed the full militarization of the police forces in the United States, now equipped with M4 rifles, sniper scopes, camouflage gear and helmet, tanks and mine resistant ambush protected vehicles and grenade launchers from the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. So Bernard's book is about the coming together of these uh, practices after 9-1-1 of um, uh, militarization of the uh, police, extensive use of surveillance um, uh, against uh, American citizens, the use of drone weapons, and I, I think the book reminds me of a phrase of Hannah Arendt at the end of the Vietnam War, you know, during the last phases of the Vietnam War, when the Nixon and Watergate scan had erupted, she wrote a very famous article in the New York Review of Books called When the Chickens Come Home to Roost. There is always a relationship between imperialist wars abroad and domestic repression at home. And it seems to me as if this book may have pulled together those connections. So why don't I turn it over to you now? Today? <clears throat> um, I'm very happy to be here, and I really do feel very honored. Uh, uh, to be in this position to talk about Bernard's book um, with him and with Chella. Um, I honestly uh, can't think of a book, uh, at least not recently, that has the three things, three attributes which I think Bernard's book has. First, it's a very good book in the sense that it's enormously well researched, it's very clear, um, he makes his point with a certain kind of verb. So in some kind of obvious sense, it's a very good book. Um, uh, the other thing is that I, it's an enormously important book. Uh, uh, because I think if you take what he's saying seriously, um, have to, in some sense, wonder uh, uh, what is the status of our democracy. And also, you have to wonder, well, uh, if he's right, uh, exactly 
uh, what does it mean to fight for democracy or, or to treasure democracy? And I'll say a little bit more about that. The third thing is that it's an enormously disturbing book. It is really very hard to read this book uh, and not feel that, you know, uh, one is in some utter dystopia. Uh, and yet, that's not how we usually go about things. You know, we don't think of ourselves ordinarily as uh, uh, living in a kind of uh, very, very troubling dystopia. And yet, to take Bernard seriously is to have to confront that. And for the last week that I've been reading this book, you know, I, I've constantly had this thought. This, this, this is a very troubling, uh, the story he tells is, is very troubling. Uh, I, I know Bernard is going to say a few things, um, uh, uh, he's going to tell you more about the book. I mean, but let me just say this. Um, the central claim, at least one of the central claims, the claim that underlies or courses through the entire book, is this claim that counterinsurgency, uh, what, right at the end of the book he calls also links with counter-revolution, uh, has these three features. Uh, one is uh, to gather information. This is, uh, uh, to get all information uh, about everyone, literally everyone, okay. uh, not just citizens. Okay. You know, there is, this is part of what I want to come back to, there is literally no boundary. The second claim is uh, to isolate the kind of insurgent or the troubling minority. Uh, and the third claim is uh, to win the favor of or pacify the majority. Um, and all three of these features, Bernard uh, documents, uh, come into the modern political lexicon, both of thinking and of practice, from uh, anti-colonial struggles in Indochina, in, 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 uh, uh, in Vietnam, and in Algeria. Uh, so as Shella was saying, there is this sense that something that was designed uh, to contend with uh, uh, anti-colonial struggles has now become a central aspect of how we are governed. As he points out, it is kind of ironic that the thing that is that has become central to our mode of governance is the thing that failed in all these contexts. <coughs> so it failed in achieving what it was designed to achieve in these anti-colonial uh, contexts. So one of the things that Bernard keeps pointing to is how um, uh, various boundaries between the military and the civilian, the foreign and the domestic, law and uh, whatever non-law is, that counterinsurgency is predicated in some sense on evacuating these distinctions. That's, that's its logic. Okay? So that uh, the way it deals with the domestic is no different than it deals with the foreign. Now, one way, uh, since all three of us are political theorists, and uh, this is just the way I tend to think, um, one way one might contextualize, uh, contextualize this is the idea of liberalism. Uh, historically uh, has been predicated on boundaries. As Michael Wilson many, many years ago in a famous essay said, uh, liberalism was based on there being distinct spheres. 
so that the military was separate from the police. Uh, the private was separate from the public. Uh, and one could go on. So part of what Bernard is, I think, pointing to, uh, and, and, and it's from that idea that one develops a theory of democracy. It's based, in some sense, on the existence of these boundaries. So what Bernard is pointing to, I think, can be thought of, and this is why I say it's a very, very disturbing book and a very troubling book, um, uh, it's that the evacuation of these boundaries, uh, I think, in some sense, makes us wonder, or makes at least me think, about what's the tenability uh, of the very distinctions on which uh, liberal democracy is based. Because I think, if I understand Bernard correctly, that you know, counterinsurgency is this process by which these important <coughs> boundaries of authority are being evacuated. Now, uh, we can talk about this more. Um, now, there is, uh, right at the end of the book, in the last chapter of the book, um, after Bernard has documented a series of enormously troubling things about the, the relationship between the military and the police, about uh, how and one of the interesting uh, theoretical claims that Bernard makes is that he, he contends that unlike people like Carl Schmidt and Agambe and, and many others uh, who want to think of uh, situations as being defined by their exceptional nature, Bernard wants to say that the story he's telling uh, is characterized by the fact that it is utterly, it is not predicated on this being exceptional. But um, uh, as he says, uh, 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 sorry, um, he says it's it's unexceptional and it's wholly coherent. So it doesn't re rely on. What the, the things he's pointing out as being exceptional. They're not exceptional in his reading. Uh, so, one question I have for Bernard is uh, if the story you're telling uh, is right, if indeed uh, this form of counterinsurgency has become wholly coherent and is deeply good. It's deeply anti. What exactly are we doing when we try and defend democracy? Because, in a sense, the story you have told is one in which the foundation now is of counterinsurgency. In some sense, to the story you are telling or you've told, it would make no difference, or it would make minimal difference, if Trump had not been elected and Hillary Clinton had been elected. Because the things that are doing the work in your account would still be there, and in your account, you know, somebody like Barack Obama comes off pretty damn badly, I mean, especially in the, uh, the increase in, in drones, etc. So, so one question I have is, you know, what's the status of, what, what is it one is doing when one tries to defend democracy? And this leads to a kind of related question, right at the end of the book, um, you talk about the importance when you're uh, just after the chapter on Occam, 
we talk about the importance of resistance and resisting counterinsurgency uh, or the counter revolution. And uh, you, you, you say you say this is very important. And then you single out a number of people um, like Daniel Ellsberg, uh, Angela Davis, um, uh, Simone de Beauvoir, various others. You cite them as people who resist. And the quality that you single out uh, is the quality of courage. For you, these are courageous resistors. Now, uh, you know, courage is to be celebrated, resistance is to be celebrated, but they stand out as individuals. And it's not clear to me, at any rate, um, that what's the vision of life? What's the vision of social relations um, uh, that was linked to that courage that you celebrate? Now, another thinker for whom courage is an absolutely crucial, perhaps the most crucial quality, uh, is Gandhi. Gandhi famously said, you know, uh, I would rather be courageous and violent than cowardly and non-violent. So for somebody like Gandhi, courage is a very important form of resistance, but courage is tied to an altogether different vision of social and political life. Uh, and I guess it wasn't clear to me um, that the people you single out, it's clear that they are resistors. It's clear that they have courage. It wasn't clear to me that that resistance or that courage was in the service of something uh, that constituted a different vision of life. And one might say that uh, uh, there is a sense in which uh, your book uh, and could be read not just pessimistically in the sense that it tells a story that is very disturbing, but it could also be read pessimistically in the sense that it doesn't give us anywhere to go. It just says resist. But one might say, why should I resist if you are right? Because if you are right, it's not clear that this form of information gathering, this form of, uh, this, this mode of governance that you have outlined, it's not, it's not entirely clear that, that one overcomes that by, as it were, heroic acts of courage, even if they're not just individual and you, you point to groups like Black Lives Matter, etc., where, where the resistance is not just individual. But one might say, well, you know, you know if you're right, it's not quite clear what all this adds up to. Anyways, I'll stop there. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you, Ude, and thank you, Sheila. I'm, I'm so uh, pleased to be uh, comforted, particularly in these moments, by <coughs> such dear friends and uh, deep thinkers. Um, and uh, I thank you all for uh, coming out this evening and uh, spending some time thinking about the counter revolution. And I also want to thank my editor, Brian Disberg, uh, from Basic Book, who's here, and who uh, really helped me make this. Uh, better than it was in its manuscript form. So um, we'll see how good it is. You'll decide for yourselves, but uh, it's a notch up from where it was sent in. Um, so you've raised a number of important issues that I really want to address today. 
And what I thought I would do perhaps is first kind of situate uh, the book in order to then address the, the, the themes that you've raised and that are extremely important uh, properly. Um, and so as you've heard uh, from both Sheila and Ude, um, the book is trying to understand a, a, the, the coherence of different practices that we are kind of, uh, marked by today, um, and that we tend to think of as being just different excesses that we see around us. Um, and in part, some of it, I mean, I remember we were on a panel once, Sheila, here, right here at this stage, and we were talking about the punitive society, and you, and you mentioned drones. And I remember being struck, as you, as you mentioned, it's like, drones, I keep, on, I keep on not thinking enough about drones and drone warfare and the civilians. And, and in part it was because all of these disparate phenomena that hit us, um, hit us so sharply that we just have a hard time putting them all together, right? I mean, there's, there's Guantanamo, and there was the, the torture of a raid, and, and then you think about uh, you know, militarized policing, and then, and, then, and then you remember that there are these drone strikes that are going on and on, and, and they, they, they seem disparate, and it was thinking through their disparateness that I started to see what there was that was coherent in all of these different phenomena. And what it was, was that they were all marked by a logic of counterinsurgency theory. And so the NSA uh, surveillance programs, uh, which I had written about a lot in the in, uh, Exposed, in my previous book, um, so they seemed very different from drone strikes, but in fact, it, it, all of a sudden it starts to make a lot of sense when you think about the theory of counterinsurgency, which is to gather all information about everyone, as we today was discussing, to gather all of the information about everyone, to parse out a small insurgent minority, to target it, in other words, to eliminate it, as you would eliminate the Viet Cong, in order to then also win the hearts and minds of the passive masses. And all of a sudden, all these strategies start to make sense as strategies of counterinsurgency. So NSA surveillance on the American people is to get everybody's information so that we can know, we can, we can know from your, from your tweets, from your posts, from your texts, from your messages, from who you're talking to, from who you're dialing, from how many hops it is to somebody else, whether you're likely to be in that dangerous category or not. And then once we have that dangerous category, a fictitious category, I argue in the book, we can then try to eliminate it through something like the Muslim ban, or by getting deporting uh, Mexican Americans, or by finding, by creating a fictitious insurgency, and then trying to eliminate it. And, in the pro and, and while simultaneously trying to pacify the masses, and that's us and many, many, and many, although many of us are targeted in different ways, pacify the masses um, through, and I, and, and I would say right now, I would say through a kind of government, a reality TV form of governing that has a different TV episode every day, right? So we are so consumed every day by the next TV episode that actually we are no longer able to think about anything, right? We, we, don't, even, we don't even discuss drone strikes anymore, even though the rates of drone strikes have gone up. Um, we don't dis you know, we don't talk about Guantanamo, even though the folks are still at Guantanamo detained in indefinitely. And we, we can't even get to those issues anymore because we're so consumed by the daily reality TV presidents that we have, right? Um, that is this form of distraction. Now, um, and so, and so, what the what the book really tried to do is to show that what we we had 
done was that we had started, to, we've started to govern in this country through these techniques of counterinsurgency, which were developed uh, in the 1960s uh, in Algeria, Indochina, in Malaya, Vietnam, etc., and that we've brought them home to roost, as you were suggesting, Sheila, and as Hannah Arendt had suggested, the chickens have come home to roost. And that we're using those techniques now on ourselves. Right? Uh, the government is using those techniques on its own citizens. <coughs> and that's with the militarized policing, or that's with the NYPD surveillance of the mosques and, uh, and, 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 and Muslim businesses. Um, that's with the increased ICE deportations, etc., arrests and deportations. Now, Okay, so that's the that's the arc. Now, you're entirely right, Ude, that um, the book was actually kind of conceptualized and written, and these and these ties uh, that I, and the coherence, um, I actually uh, were, were written with an expectation that we would be under a Clinton administration, right? Now, right? Um, and actually, there was more. There was more uh, ability to reflect, I feel, about these issues under an Obama administration, because it's almost as if today we don't even have the space or the time or the bandwidth to reflect on these issues and how they tie together. And the argument is not, indeed, that things changed with Trump, but that there was a progression from after 9-11, right? A progression from after 9-11, whereby we gradually began to first see a dominance of counterinsurgency theory at the international level in terms of our war capacity. So in Iran and Iraq, where counterinsurgency became the mode of warfare, um, which we saw with General Petraeus and uh, the counterinsurgency manual. 2006, which was a fascinating document, and I spent a lot of time discussing it in this book because um, the, the, the Petraeus manual, the counterinsurgency manual, he was he's a, he's a very uh, he's a very thoughtful and um, the, he's a theoretician really uh, of warfare, uh, Petraeus, and his greatest and favorite theorists of warfare were in fact the counterinsurgency theorists in, in France and in England, uh, David Galula, um, Thompson in England. And so that's where he got most of his theories about counterinsurgency. Um, and so that is what ties this all together back to the 1960s. Um, but we first see this movement abroad in terms of the way in which we fight wars uh, through counterinsurgency to a, move, a, a kind of colonization of our foreign policy uh, in the night, in the to, in the aughts, right? Such that our foreign policy is governed by drone strikes in outside of war zones. Right? Uh, so there's an expansion of drone strikes outside of war zones. The expansion of uh, NSA surveillance across the globe, um, and um, and uh, the use of uh, the use of uh, digital content to uh, de-radicalize. Uh, Across the, across the globe. So you see all of that kind of becoming part of uh, international uh, or foreign affairs. And then finally, what I argue is that you start to see it come home to roost uh, with uh, the militarization of the police uh, as a result of all of the excess military property that comes back uh, to US soil through the Department of Defense programs um, with militarized response against protesters. Um, the first use of a drone strike on an American citizen uh, abroad, right? So basically targeting for execution an American citizen abroad right? who hasn't been tried, uh, which happens uh, under the Obama administration. Um, and then uh, the gradual internalization of drone technology so that in Dallas, Texas, for instance, all of a sudden we're using a, a robot bomb to kill a suspect in a criminal context, right? which of course, that's not what you do in law enforcement, in domestic law enforcement. You don't kill suspects, you try to disable suspects, but you don't use drones to kill a suspect, because the suspect might be insane, or might not be guilty because of 
some other reason. Right? So you just you don't kill them, you disable them. But all of a sudden, it's kind of like pivoted. <clears throat> and then to the use of all of these technologies with um, kind of SWAT teams that are essentially doing the kind, of, performing the kind of work that they would do in Afghanistan, uh, but in our own homes. So that's the arc of the arc of the argument, and it was written with this uh, with this notion that what we've seen is a gradual turn to counterinsurgency uh, launchers uh, since 2011, uh, since 9/11, uh, since 9/11. Um, now, Trump becomes important here because, in in effect, his election kind of seals this logic. Or, or, or puts the imprimatur of the American people on this logic. And of course, it wasn't a popular vote, but it was a sufficiently popular vote that he was elected by the Electoral College. But he kind of, um, he embodied and he personified every aspect of this uh, at its most uh, 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 aggressive and most offensive, right? Um, the creation, for instance, of an internal enemy of Muslims as an internal enemy. I mean, he he instantiated that. Uh, the idea that we would that we would have a Muslim ban to keep Muslims out. The idea that that I, you know, on the campaign trail, right? He indicated that we should have uh, special ID cards for Muslims in this country. I mean, he 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 supported the NYPD surveillance. Uh, that had happened right after 9/11, and I describe it in this book. When you when you reread what what the NYPD did, for instance, it's just mind-boggling. You know, I mean, the NYPD sending undercover police agents to into not into mosques, right, without any suspicion, uh, to, into mosques, even to accompany um, white river rafting uh, students from uh, from CUNY. <laughs> right? So so it really it, we really we it, we'd seen, and, and we had seen this and, and and Trump was playing on all of these tropes, defending the NYPD, saying we should need more of that, going after Mexican Americans, going after Hispanics, um, etc. Creating internal enemies in this way. And so and so the fact that he was then elected by the Electoral College, I think, in some sense, put the imprimatur of, uh, of the American people on this way of governing, or this new way of governing. Um, and and what, I, what I ultimately argue, and that's the notion of the counter-revolution, is that what's so remarkable about it today, of course, is that we're governing through a counterinsurgency logic but there's no insurgency, right? And that's the thing that's so remarkable. That's where you've reached the perfect pitch of this form of government, right? You've got the whole logic of counterinsurgency, which was developed, of course, with counterinsurgencies in mind, with insurgencies in mind. I mean, in Algeria, there was the MLN. That was an armed insurgency. You know, in Vietnam, there was the Viet Cong. Right? I mean, these, these models of governing were developed with a particular idea that there was an insurgency, but now we've reached the point where we've perfected the mode of governing so well, we don't even need, really, an insurgency anymore. And we don't have one, I argue. I don't think we have one in this country. We, have, we do have acts of, of violence, more acts of violence that are unrelated to, uh, to, to anything that one could refer to as, a, as, a, as an insurgency. Right? Um, but we have a few acts of violence, and sometimes they claim uh, a particular ideology. Uh, usually it's because it's a radical ideology, it's attractive because of its radicality. Um, but that's what we have. We have, you know, uh, Unstable, a few unstable individuals who, 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 who lean towards the most attractive ideology, but, and whether it's like, you know what they imagine as radical Islam or white supremacy, you know, we've, we've seen a lot of that. 
and the counter revolution then is when we've achieved this point where you don't even need a real insurgency. You kind of create a fictitious insurgency that then nourishes this all the time, and that we can then project our imagination on uh, when we need to. So it was it was written as a, as a, of a long durée. It's a story of a long durée, right? Of a technology that began in the 1960s uh, in the colonies. And that was, at times, used in this country, even earlier. So the repression of the Black Panthers, for instance, um, the repression of MOVE. These were, there were counterinsurgencies that were used here before. But since 9-11, we've been on a track where we've been just kind of perfecting this to the point where, at this point, uh, we are, what I say, is governing through this model of counterinsurgency. Um, so um, now, the, the, there, let me just quickly address two, two of the points that you raised. Um, three, let me read three if I can, uh, if I'm not going too long. First is the eroding of the boundaries, um, which I think is central to what's happening right here. Eroding of the boundaries, eroding of the boundaries between the, the legal and the illegal, for instance, or between the state of exception and the, and the rule of law. Because I think what we're seeing today is that all of these different interventions are being rendered legal. Right? So that there is no longer a distinction between this fictitious state of exception, which is outside of the rule of law, and what we're doing. We don't, we don't, today we don't need to create a state of exception because through legalistic memos, and I mean, one example, one so upsetting example, of course, is you know, the 41-page memo uh, written by uh, a former colleague of mine, David Barron, a uh, law professor, justifying constitutionally uh, the drone strike of an American citizen abroad. It's rendered fully legal. It doesn't need to be a state of exception. Um, there isn't a due process problem. It's just a question of self-defense, of the country defending itself against someone who is imminently going to harm it. And so, it, it, it's, it's, so those boundaries no longer exist because we can do all of this in a perfectly legal way. So that is one of the one of the most uh, uh, maybe uh, uh, dangerous aspects of this mode of governing, precisely because once you've gotten rid of those boundaries, you have gotten rid of the, the, the traditional liberal stops. Right? Um, and once you've done that, it's very hard to figure out how to critique, I mean, what you can say. I mean, how do you, once you've gotten rid of those boundaries, it's hard to say, You've overstepped a boundary. <laughs> you know, there are no boundaries, right? Um, so that's one of the most uh, dangerous aspects of it. Um, very quickly, maybe, maybe let me um, let me very quickly get to the last point and then maybe open it up to both of you. Um, the there is a, I do I do end up in a place with a certain agnosticism about the resistance, and so you're entirely right that what I value most is the courage of resistance and the resistance itself. And I've thought a lot, I've thought a lot about that and, and, and we're actually spending the whole year and, and you've been, you've both been part of this and many of you in the room have been part of this with the seminar Uprising 13 is to kind of theorize resistance and um, Uday was on a fantastic panel uh, regarding Gandhi and Sachin Rahman which is nonviolent action that we held here, actually, at the Maison Francaise. And, and Sheila was on a fantastic panel that we had about Martin Luther King and Hannah Arendt that we held at Riverside Church. We are trying to figure out these different forms of resistance. But to me, at, at, at least at this point, and of course, you know, everything for me is a work in progress, but in this book, I am more concerned about individuals having the courage to resist along whatever line it is that they can find the courage to resist than I am in proposing a particular framework or ideology or 
or, or coherent way of thinking about the resistance and some, and some vision of the future. Um, in part because, uh, and in part here, I, I go back to King, actually, uh, in, his, um, in his speech against the Vietnam War in 1967 at Riverside Church, where he says famously, right, uh, everybody is going to protest in their own way, he says, or, or whatever, however they feel that they can uh, protest. But everybody should protest, right? And, and, and in part, you know, where I end this book with, with Occam, which takes us back to the uh, 14th century of an individual who himself was resisting very courageously uh, forms, of, uh, forms of, of warfare that were inquisitorial. Um, why well, I end there, and with others, uh, and with some groups too, but with others, is that um, I, I think it's it's extremely it's it's extremely intimidating today. Um, these uh, these modes of counter uh, insurgency, governmentality, they're extremely intimidating, and they do require a great courage on individuals' parts to stand up and to try and resist them. And, and, uh, and I don't have uh, so much a, an emphasis on, 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 on the vision that people should have in their resistance, but I am, I do believe that we need to nourish, we need to nourish the courage to stand up against these forms of um, these forms of, of uh, these 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 forms of I don't think I'm saying it too exaggeratingly these forms of terrorism right? because the use of torture is a form of terrorism that pacifies us that 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 makes us that quiets us in indefinite detention and and. Uh, and kind of a, a, a Muslim ban, right? All of these things, I think, are intimidating, and, and, and it's really hard to have the courage to resist them. And that's what I'm, more than anything, I'm asking for. So that touches a little bit, I think, I think it gives some background, but it also touches on some of the themes that you raised. Um, do, do either of you want to, um, Wonderful. I'll make two two points and then we'll open it to the floor for discussion. The first is, um, I mean, I find the analysis that you're giving very compelling. I wonder if we can try to link this analysis of the practices that you bring together a little bit also to this moment about gun violence in civil society. Yeah? The way my thinking is running is something like this. Since my metier is political philosophy, let me begin with Hobbes. I mean, the foundation of modern political thought is that the state says to civil society, lay down your arms, I will be the only one who has the monopoly of the use of violence, to use Weber's terms, right? It is as if we are in a perversely counter Hobbesian moment where the state is in fact arming and proliferating the use of weapons among its own citizens. The whole idea of you know, teachers carrying weapons into schools, an extraordinary moment, not even totalitarian movements of the 20th century would support this. This is a kind of really uh, the, the kind of an anti, anti I don't know how to describe it. As a political theory, it just catches my, my breath and I say, what is this uh, uh, promotion of violence? Because just to extend your thinking, Bernard, some of the weapons that are being used by civilians in these school shootings are military grade weapons. And part of the minimal discussion that is taking place is why does it require for civilians to have military grade weapons that have the automatic quality of you know, shooting these men and so on. So we are at an incredibly dangerous moment, moment, and it's not just the state apparatus 
that is exercising it. They, if this continues, in effect, they are going to dissolve American civil society into something we don't want to live in. Yeah? So that's, that's one, one thought uh, that I think maybe we can extend. The second concern that I have, and this may be in the book, the other uh, is both the Muslim, the Mexican, but also the migrant, the foreigner, the refugee. Everything is coming together. And uh, the criminalization of a, a migrant is an, uh, be they refugees or you know, uh, undocumented migrants, the so-called discussion about that, right? Uh, this is also an extraordinary moment because uh, uh, not only is the United States retreating from its own best liberal principles in doing this, its ethos, even if it's not its legality, its ethos, is a country of uh, migrants offering protection, it is dissolving. I mean, that moment is also sort of disappearing. But there is also another aspect of it, which is that the militarization of the border. This uh, militarization of the border, these are neither policemen nor army. That is to say, they don't have the codes that both military and the police in some ways are educated by. These are very often private firms that provide security officers. So this is also something, something to, look, uh, to look at where uh, the exception, as you say, the, the rule and the exception are being so, uh, so blurred. Uh, so these are just some, some thoughts. No, I think we should. Uh, uh, um, let me just maybe make one point. I mean, somebody, it wouldn't be me, but uh, somebody could say, look, uh, uh, Bernard, the form of resistance that you are encouraging is a form of resistance that doesn't take seriously enough the very analysis that you have offered. Because if you take seriously the analysis that you have offered, then one might say, well, um, you need something more than just resistance. Uh, uh, Especially because, you know, people might say, look, uh, there are a whole bunch of right-wing people who might be disturbed by this book. This is, you know, what the story you're telling is very important and it troubles us. Okay? So somebody might say, look, uh, uh, an alternative theory of resistance might say, look, uh, we have to resist along class lines or we have to resist along... <coughs> Um, uh, we have to resist uh, on gender lines or something. But in your account, in some sense, the resistance becomes just something one should do because uh, we're living in this terrible state. Uh, and these ideas have come. Um, another way to put the question, I, I don't expect an answer here. <coughs> One might say, so what's the, what's the analysis of social groups underlying the story you're telling? Is it just that, look, there are a bunch of ideas that were generated in the 60s in France and in England in these anti-colonial situations uh, these ideas traveled. <coughs> Galula and David Petraeus, where Galula came to ran corporation, uh, you know, Petraeus learned from him, uh, and voila, you know, uh, these ideas have taken hold, and now these ideas are spreading, and uh, it's in in these ideas that these distinctions between the exception and the rule disappear, etc. Okay, so that that's one account. Uh, but one might say, look, but what if one was to ask, well, what's the, what's the social theory?
theory. Is there a social theory or is it just that ideas travel? Okay, so let me quickly address some of these questions before we, before we open it up. Um, uh, so this the the question I think the, the question of the proliferation of guns is related in part to the question of um, kind of the theory of resistance and, and the way that they're tied together is ultimately do we believe the underlying theoretical framework of counterinsurgency theory. And, that, and that's a very interesting question, because it, it, it has very much become second nature for, for many people in this country to think that, yes, that's right, there, 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 there might be a dangerous minority that might be able to achieve something. Um, and it's true that maybe the masses or the, the general population is not paying attention, sufficiently paying attention to things or, or can be uh, led one way or the other. And I think one of the fallacies, <coughs> one of the fallacies is to fall into the trap of actually Part of your question a little bit, I, the way I heard it in part was, do we buy into the logic? Do we need to be more strategic, militarily stri military strategic in our resistance in some way? Um, and I, I, I ultimately, I ultimately believe that actually it's a constructed logic that is not necessarily that is not necessarily true that we've come to buy. And that the forms of resistance don't have to be overly theorized. For instance, we should be doing everything we can to get rid of the Muslim ban, each and every one of us. We, we, should, we should not be treating Muslims as an enemy in this country or abroad. I mean, the, the notion of a Muslim ban should be striking us as completely unacceptable, right? I mean, could you imagine a Jewish ban? I mean, a, a Buddhist ban? A, what? I mean, it should be just completely unacceptable. So now, and to resist it, I, I don't know if you need to, how you need to think strategically. I think you need to take up whatever your strength is, right? If you can represent someone, if you can go to the airport, go to the airport. If you can be a translator, be a translator. If you can give, if, if you can march in the street, march in the street, whatever. But it just seems as if 
There's got every every one of us somehow has to resist turning our populations into internal enemies, right? You know? And so yeah. and so I'm not sure that I'm not sure that one necessarily needs to internalize the the warfare strategies, but rather instead kind of resist this idea. No, we're not going to create internal enemies. We're not going to create internal enemies, undocumented uh, uh, residents who are on American soil. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't know. So. Um, yeah. Maybe we should. Okay. Sure. And uh, this one's working, so we can use, we, we can pass this one. Away. Oh, there's another one too. So. I will also know all the things, uh, of course. But, uh, thank you very much. And I have a question that starts with the way you describe counterinsurgent theory. And it seems that the singling out of a group is almost contingent, that it doesn't let the uh, what group is singled out is not per se inscribed in this counterinsurgent theory. But it, when we look at it globally, not only in the United States, there is a certain characteristic to this group. And Shayla mentioned it when she said well, Muslims, Mexican, migrants. It's put together, it's not entirely one group, but also it's not entirely contingent. And maybe to put the question differently, um, when you said there is no real insurgency in this country, there are single acts of violence. We often have these <laughs> statistics showing by whom uh, crimes, extreme crimes with many that's perhaps are committed, and so the, what might come the closest to a sort of insurgency is this metric of we're taking back our country, and conversely, um, the uh, counter-insurgent theory seems to also turn a certain blind eye to that kind of resistance. Um, so I'm wondering a little bit about this, how does the contingency of singling out a group relate to certain characteristic that are uh, shared in many countries, also in the European context. And how does that maybe also relate to the question who can resist in which way? Um, who can uh, have this courage in which way? Right. Yeah. 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 Clearly. So clearly, <clears throat> there isn't an arbitrariness to who the populations are that get targeted, right? There are patterns to who gets targeted. and. Um, and there are patterns in part related to um, in, in our social context, uh, who are the ones who tend to be uh, at disadvantage uh, politically. Um, and so um, I think it's, it's fair to say that the targeted, the targeted population, the populations that are turned into the potential insurgents Right? Muslims, uh, African Americans, particularly who are protesting uh, police violence, right? Um, Mexican Americans, Latin, Latin Central Americans, um, uh, uh, some, sometimes even LGBTQ communities uh, for some targeting, etc., are traditionally uh, groups who are who don't have uh, the kind of uh, power in the, in the democratic process uh, or in the political process uh, who, are, who are vulnerable. Right? And I think that part of the governing mechanism is to target vulnerable populations. Right? Um, that's, that's how it works. Um, so it's not, it's not going to work to target the less vulnerable populations because they'll be able to defend themselves better in some sense, right? And, and, and resist the rhetoric of turning them into uh, an insurgency. The fact, for instance, that you were suggesting, I think, in your question, the fact that we could actually think of some groups as maybe being somewhat insurgent today, right? It tends to be groups that um, that have 
more, a greater ability to defend themselves, right? Um, and therefore, an easier ability to resist the, the, the labeling of being and the insurgency and so on. So I think that those are tied to, I think all of these aspects are tied to kind of, uh, existing relations of power in society. Um, and it's playing on them, right? Okay, I see three people. Please go ahead. I don't know your name, but. Uh, two, qu yeah. two quick questions. <clears throat> So the first is, while writing this book, if you gained any insight about the question of why is it that Americans, and this is not specific or unique to, to Americans, pay more attention to violence um, when it happens internally as opposed to externally. So why is it that only when violence comes home, comes home to roost, uh, do these questions get raised more? So when there's um, either U.S. or U.S.-supported violence in the Middle East sometimes get less coverage than when word gets out that Israel trains um, America's police, for example. So that's one question. The other question is about our time and what is unique about this moment as opposed to the 20th century. So you spoke about the, the long durée and how sort of events at Malaya, at Jil, Vietnam affect current 21st century counterinsurgency policies, but then what is special about, so as opposed to the long durée, what is the, that's a um, difficult word, le vent de manualisation, uh, the event, right, about this moment that, that it still might be different um, than what happened in Malaya, what is unique about the now with counterinsurgency. Yeah, so, um, so I mean, I, I don't, I mean, I don't sense that we, I, I, my sense is that we haven't understood what's going on domestically. I mean, that's part of the, that's part of the book. Uh, you know, that's part of the intervention of the book, is to try to make sense of what's happening domestically. And in that sense, I'm not sure that there's more, um, uh, awareness or resistance to the forms of counterinsurgency in this country than there are to, you know, use of drones abroad, uh, the war in Iraq, the war in Iraq, which itself did generate uh, a lot of uh, protests and marches and, and, and etc. I don't think that there's so so. I think that there are epiphenomenal, and maybe this is part of the part of events. There there are epiphenomenal. There are moments where a particular issue attracts a lot of attention and resistance and, and mobilization, such as with the police shootings in Ferguson and in Baltimore. Um, but I, I and, and those are hot moments of resistance, powerful moments of American resistance. You look at the videos of what's going on at Ferguson or what's going on at Baltimore, in Baltimore. I mean, that's not, that's, that's serious, what's going on. But there isn't a consciousness that these pieces fit together somehow, right? That's what seems to be missing, particularly at the domestic level. Um, at the international level, I do have a sense that we do realize that it, it is a, there is a counterinsurgency theory of warfare going on, that the drones, I mean, although, although I don't think that we thought of the torture as fitting into a counterinsurgency. Well, we, thought of, we thought of the torture as being just this, oh my goodness, it's this uh, exceptional thing that happened under the Bush administration, and uh, it was terrible, and it happened, and. You know, but you know, you could carve it out and say, okay, uh, we did that. It, it was not a good thing to do. Right? Part of the book is to try to show that actually torture fits very neatly in the counterinsurgency theory. Um, it was, it was, it was very much part of the experience in Algeria, and it fit in the logic very well. And so you can have these slight variations of counterinsurgency theory, but 
But those things fit in over there. And what I'm trying to show is, similarly, many of the phenomena in here fit together uh, under that logic. Uh, and so, and so ultimately, I, I think I resist the idea that we 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 see it more here than over there. Um, I'm, I'm I'm wondering actually if we see it more over there than over here. Okay, I have about six or seven questions, Sorry, but I do raise your hands at different times. Fred Neuhauser was one of the first dancer, and I have a list here. But yes, why don't we take two questions together because the time, so Fred, go ahead. Um, I'll try to make this short. It picks up on your, do we really understand what's going on domestically? Um, and it's, it's, it's just this. What exactly are the ends of counterinsurgency tactics when there is no insurgency? So in Algeria and Vietnam, it's relatively easy, I think, to say what the ends are. So what are they in this case when there's no insurgency? Um, and the suggestion might be that it's, it's a phenomenon. It's, is this a rational phenomenon in some minimal sense of that term? Or is there, are there really no aims to it? Or how, how do you understand the aims? Okay, hold that box. Sorry. We're going to start taking two at a time. Uh, thank you, Bernard. Um, so without having read the book yet, <laughs> I have two questions. So the first is, when you say that we don't have an insurgency, I, I want to push back and I wonder if what you're really talking about is preemptive counterinsurgency. Particularly if we look back at the McCarthyism era and the COINTELPRO and the way in which African Americans, particularly quote unquote black militants, black Muslims, have been treated. And, and so, so the question is how is what we're seeing now different domestically than what we saw in the 60s and the 70s, particularly vis a vis uh, blacks, African Americans, and, and racial minorities? Uh, than now? Is it merely a change in opportunity as a result of technological advancement? And so what the state is doing is more of the same, but much more extreme because it has tools? Or is it a reflection of a substantive change in norms, which is followed consequently by change in law, or reinterpretation of law, um, because of the fact that there have always been potential micro-insurgencies by groups that are racialized as a threat. Right, great, great. Um, let me, so uh, I think that actually these questions relate to each other. Um, and so I'm going to take them backwards, uh, come back to you, Fred, because I think we'll see, I think, I think we can see what's going on better in terms of the overall goals. But, so for instance, the difference with the repression of the Black Panthers, right? Which was it was a, there was a it was a counterinsurgency logic in the repression. There's no doubt about that. But there's gaining the information about the Black Panthers meant learning everything about the Black Panthers, right? Today we have total information awareness about all Americans in a way in which we weren't, the, the FBI wasn't doing that in its targeting of the Black Panthers. Now, and so what's, and, and so what's the difference there right, is that in the 1960s and in various points in the 1980s with the MOVE movement and elsewhere, there were kind of ex small experiments, localized experiments at, at trying to use this new technology of counterinsurgency on a particular group that was deemed uh, dangerous. But I think what's happened since 9-11 is that it has become a mode of governing us all. Right? Um, and, so we get, and so we get information about everyone, everybody's phones, all of your social media, all the data, it's total information awareness, to then try to create internal enemies that I, I sense are fictitious. 
Um, because you, you need a notion of the internal enemy to keep fueling this logic, right? And so we, we create Muslims as internal enemies, et cetera. Right now we have a new category, and you heard of the a radical black extremist, right? That the FBI has identified identity, you know, a radical black identity extremist, right? Um, uh, um, so we create these categories in, in, in order then to, to, to then govern through this method. And, and I think that's what the goal is, essentially. To have control of the population um, and to benefit from it. Um, because ultimately, ultimately the, all of this is about distributional consequences. Um, it's about who's going to be able to benefit economically. Um, and so um, I think that that's what's going on. <coughs> the goal is to actually develop a mode of governing the American population that puts the control of the American population in the hand of a small minority. So, but now to continue on this question of what you've, of what particularly is happening in this moment um, and under Trump, it occurs to me that maybe there's a way in which there was this logic of counterinsurgency that was available and that was and that's been developed through through uh, since 9/11 um, through all these different aspects that you've discussed and that was available to Trump and to Trump supporters um, to use to target particular groups that, that are not arbitrary. They're, they're all groups that are not white and that are not men. I mean, that are not, yes, that are not men and that aren't straight. And so um, there was this, this um, kind of logic that was available that's being used to oppress particular groups. Um, in this kind of, I mean, there's a, there's a way in which the whole Trump movement is is um, very much based on um, racism, right, and a, a kind of a revanche for having Obama in the White House for eight years. So I wonder if what you think of that as a way of um, not, you know, Trump didn't invent this, and he's building on something that pre-existed, but it was available for him to use in particular ways to reassert white dominance. So is that part of what's going on? Yes. Yeah. Oh. Um, so you just say. Yeah. Uh, sorry, my name is Luca. Uh, I'm in oh, yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, so I guess my question is about whether we. I, I think I buy the idea that as a theory, counterinsurgency has proved really important. 60s counterinsurgency from Kalula or Tranquier. And I, I see that in the of it. But I'm also kind of thinking about the practices, and maybe this question opens up to the question of just what practices are portable into you know, contemporary democracy from the 60s or 70s. Because when I think of French counterinsurgency on the practical level, I think that whatever Kalula was saying, you know, you have mass torture in order to extract information from citizens on French territory, because Algeria is considered part of France, right? And on the other hand, you have basically the targeting and kill, targeted extrajudicial killing of political opposition. And then you have massacre of protesters. You know, that's a consistent theme in French kind of counterinsurgency and, and colonialism from the post-war period. So Madagascar, then Setif, and then you have massacres during the Algerian War, and ultimately in Paris itself, right? But so when I think about the way that protest policing happens today in the United States, the police is out there with militarized equipment, they're aiming to intimidate a population, but you don't have massacres in the same way that you would still have even in the United States in the 60s and 70s, right? You have Kent State, State Jackson State, I think Elizabeth Hinton has said in civil disturbances in the United States in the 60s and 70s, there were like two, 250 to 300 black people were shot dead. So it seems to me that in some ways, Although the theory of counterinsurgency irrigates contemporary practices, there are certain things that, it seems to me that maybe one of the things that 
has allowed counterinsurgency to flourish as a mode of government in the United States domestically has also been that it's managed to jettison at some of the more ostentatious practices to define counterinsurgency practice in the 60s and 70s. Yeah. So, um, so, so, show me. I think that uh, I think that with the election of Trump, the form of governing through counterinsurgency has taken a particular direction, right? That it would not have taken under a Clinton administration. Okay. Um, and I, I think that's, 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 that's very fair, that what we've seen is the development of a mode of governing that has been kind of pushed in a particular direction or used toward particular ends that are explicitly, that are explicitly kind of white supremacist uh, in a way now that I think we never would have seen and patriarchal. And, and patriarchal. Right, 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 yeah. So, 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 so I'm, I'm, I'm wondering whether, and, and, you know, I'm continuing to think this through, whether what we have is an arc that then gets pushed in a particular direction, right, uh, today, as a result of, um, of Trump. Because, I mean, what's interesting is that, you know, it had a very different flavor under Bush than it did under Obama. And part of what I was trying to suggest is, you know, I mean, I'm not the kind of person who says there's no difference between Bush and Obama, and there's no difference between Clinton and Trump. I'm not that, I mean, that's not the point I'm trying to make. What I'm trying to make is that there is a shared logic that manifests itself in different ways. And so, for instance, between the Bush and the Obama administration, there was a shared logic that took on a different form. With Bush, it was torture, right? I mean, torture was preeminent, and detentions at Guantanamo. Um, the minute that Obama becomes president, drones uh, skyrocket. I mean, if you, if you look at the, the stream, if you actually look at the, the video that drone stream makes of, like, of the drones in Pakistan, and it's, it's, you know, all of a sudden it's the Obama administration, all of a sudden they are really starting to, to go in, right? It, different form, different tools were being used, drones, not uh, some forms of rendition, etc., or some, some more subtle forms. Um, but they were being done. Killing uh, an American citizen abroad, right? That was something that would then be justified in uh, 2010. So, um, so I think that it's undoubtedly true that under a Trump administration, it gets pushed in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a just a, a direction that it's, it's hard to fathom. I mean, it's hard to listen. It's hard to imagine. Yes, the, the patriarchal and the white supremacist elements to it, um, and that wouldn't have been the case. But the question is whether there is still this similar logic that that drives it or that makes it function, and that allows that. Um, and that's what I would say. Now, and then, uh, look at that. So that's a that's a that's a great question. I mean, I wouldn't. I I'm not here to kind of um, make everything coherent. And to, to, to kind of like kind of stuff everything into my theory, um, uh, I think it's true that there have been some forms of what would be considered counterinsurgency repression, possibly Kent State or or in the 1960s and 70s, that when you look at them again today, you think, wow, I mean, that was, that was, that was pretty massive right there. Um, I don't, 
I mean, I, I like the suggestion that kind of counterinsurgency has uh, learned its limits in a certain way so as not to trigger particular violent responses or not to kind of fuel uh, the responses, which might be one explanation. I'm not sure. Um, I'm not sure. It, it could be, and this goes back a little bit to this question of arms and weapons, that, you know, I mean, when you look at the pictures, and I, I was able to get some pictures from Getty and AP about the hyper-militarized police in Ferguson, that, I mean, you know, I mean, it's, you know, I mean, it is so armed, I mean, these tanks, right, that, you know, maybe they don't need to exercise the violence as much because the disparities are so extraordinary between these protesters who are basically in t-shirts and these people who look as if they're literally going to, you know, storm some town and some boat in, in Afghanistan, right? Uh, I mean, it could be that we've achieved such an imbalance at this point uh, in, the, in the weaponization, etc., that you, you don't even really need to use it anymore because, because it's just so extraordinary. And that related a little bit to the guns point also. I mean, I think that guns, the, the, I think that the, you know, the pro-Second Amendment, gun, I, I don't think that individuals carrying a gun, even well-armed individuals with AR whatever, I don't think that that presents a threat to the counter because, um, because, because, the, the, the counter-revolutionaries are so well armed, I mean, it's so, so massively armed, that I don't think that individuals, even armed individuals, are that much of a, of a threat to the mode of government at this point. Exactly. Well, surprising. So it's not all over yet. Yeah. Yeah. No, well, that's the first <laughs> <of> the last <laughs> <time>. <laughs>